in the forest tradition as in all of Theravada. There's a lot of emphasis placed on what you have to do in your practice. After all, the Dhamma is bachatan wedi dabo when you heat, to be seen by the observant for themselves. Your Dharma team will have to depend on your actions. You can't give it to anybody else. You can give advice. But as the Buddha said, he's just the one who points out the way other people have to follow the instructions. He was challenged one time by a man who asked him, why is it that some people, when you give them instructions, get awakened and other people don't? The implication was the Buddha was giving different teachings to different people. But he asked the man, do you know the way to Rajagaha? The man did. And when you describe it to someone, do they all follow the path that you told them? He said, well, no, they don't all. Some of them take a wrong turn here, wrong turn there. But what can I do? I give them correct instructions. And the Buddha said the same with him. He gives the instructions if it's up to the individual to follow them. And given the emphasis placed on what each of us has to do for him or herself, it's good to remember every now and then how much we have to depend on one another. We'll see this especially tomorrow with the ordination. The people have come to give encouragement and support for the new novice. And the monks who receive them into the community. There's a lot of mutual dependence there. When you practice, and everybody practicing here is really dependent on the generosity of a lot of people. The saw that we're sitting in, the land we're sitting on, the food we eat, almost everything we have except the air we breathe, we owe to the generosity of somebody. It's good to think about that. So I want to practice with a sense of gratitude. They didn't have to give this place. Nobody was forced. Nobody felt a sense of obligation. It was just out of the purest generosity of their heart. So you want to be grateful for that. It's one of the first virtues that's taught in Thailand. Gratitude. Here in the West, we miss it a lot. So many people grow up with a sense of entitlement, that things are owed to them. Then we forget the basic principle in the Buddhist teachings that if you want to receive, you have to give first. And when someone else goes out of their way to give for you, and they made that choice and they took on that burden, the proper response is, you, which literally means a sense of what was done, a sense of the choices people made. It means gratitude. And you share your gratitude in two ways. One is by dedicating yourself to the practice. Because as the Buddha said, the higher your attainment, the more merit goes to the people who supported you. And they themselves get inspired that the generosity they've given gifts they've given have been put to good use. At the same time, you want to be as unburdensome as possible. We're not here to have all of our needs met. We have to pare down our needs. This is not one of the reasons why we meditate. Working with the breath is medicine for the body, food for the body, nourishment for the body. It provides a sense of ease and well-being, so that you can live in simple circumstances and not feel deprived. So you want to have gratitude and express your gratitude through being persistent in the practice, being content with what you've got in terms of material things, and being unburdensome in the requests you make. Those three aspects are in line with the Buddha's definition of what counts as dharma. 
as you said, you test the different things you've learned by whether they make you content or discontent, burdensome or unburdensome, persistent or lazy. So you want to choose the, the teachings that make you persistent, putting out effort, that make you content, that make you unburdensome. That way you don't abuse other people's generosity. You actually provide them with a sense of satisfaction that, that what they gave has been well used. The other way in which you take on dependence as you practice is in your relationship to the teachers. But that's what the word nisaya means when, when the ordinate asks for take dependence on the preceptor. It means you have to depend on the preceptor for his instruction in all kinds of ways. Because the Dharma is not just a matter of the words. There are people who are clever at reading the words and arguing. But those aren't the people, as the Buddha said, those aren't the people who maintain the Dharma. The people who maintain the Dharma maintain it in their actions. Body, speech, mind. And that kind of lesson isn't going to be just in words. It's interesting in the Thai, the word for habit, nisai, is taken directly from the Pali word nisai, dependence. The connection being that you're trying to pick up your teacher's habits. I mean, not all his habits. You may have some bad habits here and there. But look for what's good. And not just with the teacher, look all around you. Because you're here to change the way you eat, to change the way you walk, change the way you wear your clothing. You want to bring things in line with the Dharma. And as John Vuong said, you can't expect the teacher to hand everything you, to you on the platter. This is not a public education system where the teacher is obliged to give you everything in words and assume that you're not really interested in learning things, and so it has to go out of his way to make things interesting. Here you're expected to show some interest of your own. In John Fung's analogy, he said it's like learning to be a thief. You want to steal something from the people down the road. You don't go up to the door and ask them, where do you keep your valuables, what time of the day are you away so I can come and pick them up easily. Oh, and by the way, tell me the combination to the lock. You've got to observe. When are they home? When are they not home? What part of the house seems to be the area where they are most protective? Look, observe. Put yourself out, and then you gain. So wherever you see somebody doing something well, speaking well, acting well, expressing things well, take that as a lesson. And you're here to pick up as many lessons as you can. When you have that attitude, then you learn a lot, because there's always something to be learned every day, not just in the Dharma talks or in what you read. But when you learn about how, how to behave in a way that's in line with the Dharma, so as we practice, we're dependent in two ways. We're dependent on the people who support or give material support, and we're dependent on the people who've been passing this tradition down for centuries. It's been a lived apprenticeship. It's not a correspondence course or an internet chat room. It's people living with one another, 
supporting one another, learning from one another in all aspects of life. That's how the Dharma gets maintained, and that's how we get the most out of it. Because it is up to us to get the most out of it. The Dharma is there, it's complete. The question is, how much of it are you going to absorb? If you just have the attitude, well, just do enough to get by. You're missing a lot. And it's not helpful to the people who come after you. You want to keep this as a lived tradition, so that not only you benefit from it, but people who come after you will benefit from it as well.